to you this morning in, um, with all that that means anew today. God, we bring it all before you. We invite you now, Holy Spirit, be our teacher. <sighs> Teach us just what you need us to hear this morning from your word. Uh, our goal is, is to be close to your heart, and your heart is to grow us and transform us. So we're here for that today. Lord, we ask that in Jesus' name. Would you do it? Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, you guys. Well, think for a minute of all the choices that you have to make in a day, or um, I should rather say you get to make in a day. You know, when you're going to wake up, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. I was thinking yesterday, what music I want to listen to on Spotify. You can choose all throughout, big choices, little choices. We also get to choose how I want to live today. Where am I going to give my attention? What am I going to do with my mind today? And God is so gracious to us. He didn't make us robots. He could have, but he chose to give us freedom to choose to follow him and to know a life of abundance or not. And our central idea today that I want us all to remember is that God brings victory as we choose to walk in trust and obedience. We're going to talk about that. I thought about singing trust and obey. Anybody? Yes. I love you people. You're my people. All right. Lesson three. Here's our outline for today. Victory and obedience. We have the fall of Jericho in Joshua 6. We have Achan's sin and Israel's defeat in Joshua 7. And then Ai is destroyed and the covenant is renewed in Joshua 8. So just to review, the children of Israel are right on the brink. They just crossed over their first steps into the promised land. They've been delivered from Egypt with Moses, and they wandered through the wilderness for 40 years. They crossed the Jordan, and they're ready to go into this land of Canaan. And remember, we're talking about how this promised land, this land of Canaan, is a picture for us of a spirit-filled, abundant life. We're trying to see what does that look like. We've been saved from our Egypt right? Our bondage to sin. We knew no other way to live. But now through Christ's power, that power is broken in our lives and we can know peace. We can know victory as we walk to Jesus, with Jesus. And up to this point in Joshua, everything's been more or less kind of preparatory. But today it's about to get very real, right? The real task is before them. The Canaanites must be driven out if Israel's to occupy the land. And the end of our lesson last week, the commander of the army of the Lord, most likely Jesus himself, had appeared to give Joshua instructions for the battle. So we start in the book of Joshua 6, 2. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus you shall do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. When they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people will shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up everyone straight before him. Now this is a strange battle plan indeed, right? To walk in silence around the city with the seven priests first, and then the ark, and then the men of war. And then the seventh day, seven times around, and the walls were going to come tumbling after they blew those trumpets. This took a lot of faith, don't you think? This took a lot of faith to believe that God could work this way. And, you know, they had a choice. They had a choice to obey and follow God's detailed instructions or not. And they were told the Ark of the Covenant, again, was to lead the way. The Ark, again, was going to be prominent in this victory, just like it was when they crossed the Jordan. 
Israel had to keep their hearts and their minds on the presence of God. He was with them. It wasn't. Their hearts couldn't be on the difficulty of the task or whether they had enough weapons. What They had to just concentrate and see that visual representing God's presence going before him. Verse 10 says, Joshua commanded the people, you shall not shout or make your voice heard. Neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. So they were told to not say a word. Maybe the hardest command of all, right? Especially if you're like me. And you know, I love to try to put myself in stories in the Bible, like using my imagination. Okay, if I were there... What would I have been saying if I had been allowed to talk? Can you imagine them walking around, my camp, this crazy thing, what are we doing? Walking around this village, grumble, grumble, grumble. This is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. What are we doing, you know? God was very smart, right? Don't talk. And you know, a sermon of pastor I love was talking about this, and he he was bringing out, you know, we can feel like we're marching around walls of resistance sometimes, that we have these impossible situations where the gates feel closed to us. You know, broken relationships, uh, you know, me and my teenager, or me and my husband, and no matter what we try to do, we just can't fix it. We reason and we talk and we share scripture and it feels like we're going in circles, endless dialoguing. But sometimes the best thing may be just to be quiet, you know? Don't say a word and wait for God to bring down those walls. You know, I have a, if it's, if it's some of the situations I'm thinking of, those people, they know exactly my point of view. They've heard it. They know the truth. Um, maybe it's time for me to just stop talking and wait for God to work and listen. Because remember, God can solve that situation in a minute. He can change that heart. When the Holy Spirit comes in, he can bring those walls down. Sometimes we need to just keep following the presence of God. Just quiet. I'm just going to be faithful to march behind you, Lord. I'm going to be seeking you. Where are you going? How can I follow you? And in these tough battles, we really do need perseverance, you know, that kind of tenacity to keep going. You know, I wonder what Israel was thinking on the fifth or the sixth time around on that last day. But they did it. And the seventh time, they, sh- they gave up a great shout, for the Lord has given you the city. It took a lot of courage and a lot of trust. And the very specific instruction to them was that everything was devoted to destruction. Only Rahab and all who were with her could live. They were told not to take anything. And one commentator I read said that this city was the first one that they were going to conquer. So just like the Old Testament sacrifice, they brought their first fruits. The very first of their harvest would be offered completely to God. And this was a picture of that. This city fortress was full of idols and things associated with the demonic and depraved worship of the people of Canaan. But the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and silver and iron, they were holy to the Lord, and they would go into the treasury for the Lord's work. So 621 says, Then they devoted all the city to destruction, men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, donkeys, with the edge of the sword. This is really tough. This was really hard to read. I don't know if you guys felt heavy doing this lesson. The Enduring Word commentary says such judgment seems harsh to us because it is harsh. And we must recognize that at unique times, God has commanded that such judgment be made. It may happen either through an army that he's used in the case here or through judgment that he brings such as Sodom and Gomorrah. And this summer, as I was reading and studying Joshua, I came across a series lecture on violence in the Old Testament. And I just was like, help me, help me understand some of this. And they did have some good insights. 
So we have to understand, it wasn't that Israel was like this superpower coming in to defeat these little, weaker nations. Israel was the underdog. You know, as for weaponry, they were completely outgunned. Canaan had high-tech chariots and horses. Israel had none. The cities were fortified and heavily defended. Israel's defense system was a wooden box. The Ark of the Covenant, God's presence. Canaan had generals who had perfected their battle strategies for years. Israel had been wandering in the desert for 40 years. They were outnumbered and outmanned. The, the battle strategy of Jericho is ridiculous. It's like storming Normandy with guitars and drums, right? Like going at Fort Knox with some water pistols. And they were called to enter in a posture of worship and see God work and defend them. And as we wrestle with some of these, you know, painful passages that we're going to be seeing for the next couple of weeks where God says, wipe out these cities. One insight that I thought was helpful was that the context of these cities is that they were military fortresses. Most of the time, the cities weren't the neighborhoods where life, community life would take place. They weren't full of civilians. They were guarded outposts. Jericho, was, they, they think, was only six acres large. So it was more like taking out the Pentagon, not Washington, D.C. It was an isolated place. And that's why all of Israel could circle it seven times. It was an isolated military fortress. And they were told to take out these kings who were more like military leaders and generals. And if the battle was coming, the people would scatter. The civilians that could would scatter. So the people left in these fortresses were mainly the soldiers and, unfortunately, some civilians. But that, that helped me to kind of put it more in perspective of God's, in, God's heart and his instructions. So the city was burned and the articles of gold and silver were saved, but they didn't forget Rahab, right? Joshua 6.25, but Rahab, the prostitute, and her father's household, and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. This was the day she got a new name. She was not going to be Rahab, the prostitute. Now she was Rahab, the beloved wife. Rahab, the mom, the grandma, Praise God for her faith, and she was rewarded and her family saved. So chapter 6 ends that the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. So just kind of a review. What are some things we see in this battle of Jericho that we can take as examples for ourselves? All of Scripture was written as an example for us. So here are some ideas. The victory at Jericho, it took faith, right? Joshua and Israel believed the battle plan. It took obedience. I love what Pastor Keenan shared, that we obey what we know. It's not about all learning. If we just obey what we hear, God is going to work. They followed the plan exactly. They had courage. There was a lot of danger involved. They had endurance. They followed it over a period of time when it seemed that nothing was happening, right? On those six days. And lastly, they trusted. Israel didn't rely on just scheming and methods, even when, it's, um, even when it was a little bit crazy, right? And it wasn't based on human ingenuity. And, you know, even as you're reading these things, where might God be calling you to exercise faith, obedience, courage, endurance, and trust? I know I'm all about my, my quiet time with God in the morning and he'll speak to me and I'll have great, yes, I'm going to live for you. And then the day happens. And it's like, how am I bringing that courage and that faith and that trust into the crisis that happens after lunch, right? How am I choosing to trust God then? God is going to give us victory as we choose to walk in trust and obedience. But the children of Israel did something wrong. 
Chapter 7, the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Some translations say, took some of the cursed things. These things that were associated with the demonic and debasing worship practices of the Canaanites. What would the consequences of this sin be? Well, the next battle was before them. They were going to conquer the city of Ai, and they sent spies to check it out. And those spies came back. Verse 3, they returned to Joshua. They said, ah, don't have all the people go up. Let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack. Don't make the whole people go there. They're just a few, right? And it's interesting how fear makes our enemy look bigger, right? But pride makes the enemy look smaller than it truly is. And what's tragic in all of this is we don't ever see any prayer or consulting of God. They thought, eh, piece of cake. And I'll give you a little preview, our memory verse for next week. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. We see a lot of leaning on understanding. Ah, go ahead, it's not a big deal. And the army of Israel fled before the city of Ai and 36 men were killed. So the hearts of the people melted, Joshua 7, 5, and they became as water. And Joshua tore his clothes and fell on the earth, his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, he and the elders of Israel. And they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we'd been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. He and the elders were mourning. They were in a state of mourning the loss of the blessing and the guidance of God. And they didn't take this defeat lightly. It wasn't like, ah, win a few, lose a few mentality, right? They knew that every battle mattered and there's always a reason for defeat. It doesn't just happen. So the Lord explained to Joshua, Israel has sinned. They've transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They've taken some of the devoted things. They've stolen and they've lied. And they've hidden them in their own belongings. Oh, the power of hidden sin. You know, we looked up a verse in, in 1 Corinthians 5 where, where Paul says that just a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A small amount of sin accepted and tolerated among believers can affect the whole group. And you know, we might be involved in great ministry, we might look great on the outside, but if sin is hidden in our hearts, we are not going to be in God's blessing. We're not going to know his victory. It becomes like a cancer and destroys us. We lose the intimacy and closeness with God. So God told Joshua what to do. Verse 13, get up, consecrate the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel, and you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. You can't stand before your enemies until you get these things out of your life. Is this a word for us today? You know, you might think your sin is, ah, it's no big deal. I got it pretty well hidden, right? But if there's something in your life that shouldn't be there, we can't stand in victory. And, and the thing about hidden sin is it has a special power over us. It steals our victory. It's, it's kind of like something gone bad in your refrigerator where things are bad. That's my case right now. There's something in my refrigerator that is nasty and I've not had the time to go. It's like in there festering. And that's what hidden sin does. And you know, my husband and I, early in our marriage, we made an agreement with each other that we would always have a trusted friend that we could talk to if we were struggling with a sin that was too hard to talk to each other about. And we've both 
done this faithfully. And you know what the miracle is? Is as soon as you speak a sin, the, often the power is broken. The sting of it, the power over us is broken. And you know, what are hard things that you might need to share with a trusted sister in Christ today? And I mean, this is really hard. I'm, I'm getting in your business. You know, I, I have too many glasses of wine before dinner. I'm attracted to someone and they are not my spouse. I'm looking at things online that I shouldn't. Satan loves to keep these things festering and hidden because he knows that we're not effective for the kingdom when we're living in those places. I've got to go home and find out what is in my refrigerator. <laughs> I, I shudder to think what it is. We have to consecrate ourselves in confession and humility to see God work because God gives victory as we choose to walk in trust and obedience. So they brought the tribes before God and God told them he would choose who it was. And, and Joshua said to Achan, my son, give God the glory. Give praise to him. Now that you've done this, don't hide it from us. And Achan confesses. He says, yes, I took the silver, the gold, the beautiful garment. I took it and I hid it. So they brought him and his whole family to the valley of Achor. And verse 25, 26, Joshua said, why did you bring this trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones, and they raised a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then, beautiful words, the Lord turned from his burning anger. And you know, as I read more about this horrible scene, if you picture it, you know, many scholars allow that Achan's family weren't necessarily stoned with Achan, that instead of being killed with their father, their children could have been brought just to witness the judgment of their father. There's much use of the singular verb in this chapter, you, Achan, stone you. And in reference, the plural could be to Achan's possession, stone them, not his children. So I'm just putting that out there. But it shows us that our sins have repercussions. Our sins rarely just affect us. And it causes defeat in the family of God that we have to deal with. We need this daily rhythm. I heard the gospel described as the knowledge that I am a worse sinner than I can even imagine, but I'm loved and forgiven more than I can imagine. And that needs to be our daily rhythm. I love 1 John 1, 9. I heard it called God's scrub brush. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and righteous. So he'll forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus forgives us of our sin because he bore the consequences. Achan bore the consequences of his sin and the people of Israel. But on the cross, Jesus took the punishment that I deserved, which was death and separation from him. So Jesus is going to cleanse us from all unrighteousness when we confess our sin to him. And as we confess that sin, guys, we're going to see it's going to lose its grip on us as we share it with that trusted sister by the work of the Holy Spirit. God is gonna give us victory as we choose to walk in trust and obedience. And sometimes God wants to use our failures in a redemptive way, to use them as the foundation for a great victory in the Lord. And that's the case here in Joshua 8. We're gonna see AI destroyed and the covenant renewed the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear, do not be dismayed. Now take all the finding men with you, arise and go up to Ai. See, I've given them into your hand, the king of Ai and his people, his city and his land, and you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourselves. Lay an ambush against the city behind it. 
So the plans were made for this ambush, and there were some pictures. Now I kind of wish I had, I had brought them because there are pictures of arrows like, Joshua's here, the army's here, AI goes here, there's all these arrows. Right? It's actually a brilliant military strategy that military people have studied and copied what the Lord told him to do. To set this ambush behind, they approach from the front, and AI thought, oh good, another chance to rout these people. And Joshua, they pretended to be beaten and ran and drew them all out into the city, and then they turned around, and not a man was left in Ai. Verse 18 says, Then the Lord said to Joshua, Stretch out the javelin that is in your hand toward Ai, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the javelin that was in his hand toward the city. I love this Sunday school picture. I love that one. That was the signal for the ambush to enter and set fire. There was nowhere for that army to go. No one escaped or survived. And Joshua didn't draw back his hand, which he stretched out until he had devoted all the inhabitants to destruction. And we saw in our homework, this was, this was very reminiscent of Exodus 17, where Moses held up his rod, his hands, and Aaron and her were holding up his arms, and God gave them a victory. I wonder if God whispered in Joshua, it's your turn now, Joshua. You get to carry on that legacy. Hold up that javelin until victory is won, and they could plunder the livestock and the spoil. God gave them a great victory as they walked in obedience and trust. And now at the end of chapter 8, it was time for a very special covenant ceremony. They headed from Ai to Ebal and Gerizim, which were about 20 or 25 miles from the town of Ai. But it's right in the middle of the promised land that God had given to them. Uh, 8.30 says, At that time Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the people of Israel. As it is written in the book of the Law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones upon which no man has wielded an iron tool. And they offered burnt offerings to the Lord. And it's so amazing. We, again, we looked in our homework at Deuteronomy where the Lord had told Moses, tell them to do this. He saw this day was coming. When you guys get to the promised land, this is what I want you to do. And Sylvia Moy and my group had this checklist of everything that they fulfilled. Check, check, check. Wasn't that fun? Wasn't that fun to do? All that they fulfilled in the instructions of Moses. And you know, as I was studying this, I thought there's got to be more. Of, show this picture of Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. So I just typed in, I got to learn more. And you guys, you have to love the internet. What pops up is seven facts everyone should know about Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. I'm not kidding you. Kabad.org. So these two mountains that you can see right in the center of the promised land, they, um, according to tradition, Mount Gerizim was lush and fertile, while Mount Ebal was rocky and barren, clearly portraying the ramification of our choices. It's a picture of the challenge we face every day. The two mountains are so close together that at the base, some commentators said it was like 500 feet between the base of these two mountains. So they brought the ark of God, the presence of God, and then half of the Israelites were on one side at the base of one mountain, and the other half were at the base of the others. And what was cool is it was this beautiful, natural amphitheater where the whole nation could hear the reading of the law. Joshua 8, 34. Afterwards, he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse. According to all that is written in the book of the law, there was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them all that were there, all, everyone was there, and I just have to picture these moms holding their babies. Shh, little Benji, listen. This is, this is the choice we have. Listen to this. This is the words of God. They weren't dumbed down. They weren't like politically corrected. That was just the words of God. 
This is the choice you have. It's such a powerful moment, fulfilling that prophecy and the instruction of Moses. And he was giving them a choice. God gives us a choice. You know, and we choose to be a follower of Jesus. We make that decision and we set our lives on this path of living in his kingdom for his plans and purposes. And each day, we again get to choose that path, cleaving to God, following his ways, leading a, a life that is bearing fruit, seeing our hearts transformed more and more like Jesus. But alternatively, we can disobey God. We can just keep learning and learning and never stop to ask, how can I obey? How am I keeping my sins hidden? Which can lead to an empty and barren life. We can miss all these good things that God has prepared for us to do. His purposes will prevail, but we can miss those good things that he has just for us to do. So my challenge today is to choose to trust and obey as we wait for God's victory. And I want to end today with, I'm going to jump way ahead in Joshua. The very last two chapters are his farewell address. He's an old man now, and he's still saying the same message. Guys, you have a choice. This is what he says in Joshua 24, 15. Choose you this day whom you will serve whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So how will you choose to trust God and obey him more fully today? I have some ideas for myself. Definitely. Let's pray. God, thank you for your um, grace um, thank you for the freedom that you give us. Um, thank you that your heart is for us to choose each day to walk in obedience, to walk in blessing, to walk in peace and joy, following what we know you've commanded us. Lord, I pray for each of us. If, you, if you're stirring up things that we know need to be confessed, God, give us discernment. Who are those trusted Christian sisters in our lives? That we can just say, can I talk to you? Can we go out to coffee? Can I be honest with you? And Lord, break the power today of that hidden sin in our lives. Lord, the things that we feel like, I can just never get over this. I'm never going to get out of this cycle, God. Break, break that cycle in our lives today. Use your spirit. Use, use trusted friends, God. We long to know fruit lives, lives that are bearing fruit for your kingdom. We want to see our lives transformed and those around us, God. Will you come and do that work in our hearts, in our midst today? We thank you in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So thanks, you guys. This is a really heavy lesson. You guys all have my email. It's on Fisher, and I'm always up for a chat.